Okay, we're ready. Thank you for your patience, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, so you've got your Bibles open to Joshua. Those of you who are here, you have a bulletin. You can fill in your notes. We're glad you're here. Thanks for being patient. We're ready to go. We are continuing in our series uh, called Route 66. I heard that David Jeremiah is doing Route 66. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit during Flock Talk. There's something else about David Jeremiah that I want you to hear about. All right, so the book of Joshua, which is the book of contagious faith. So uh, we've prayed, we've checked in, we're ready to go, and we want to jump into this. So, so here we go. The book of Joshua is all about the people of Israel, God's people, finally taking possession of the promised land. The land that used to be called Canaan, that is now called Israel, uh, is central to the book of Joshua. <clears throat> if you look through the book, you can read through it if you want to, or you can do a little word search. That word land appears 159 times in the book of Joshua. So it's, it's central to the theme of the book. And the question, one of the questions we need to answer before we continue on <clears throat> is why this land? Why the land of Canaan? Why did God want his people to settle into that land? Here's a map of the west, eastern hemisphere, and Israel is highlighted there in red. You can't see it, so I'm just going to circle it. Israel is a tiny little sliver of real estate, one-sixth the size of Washington State. It's a very small piece of real estate, but it's central to God's story of redemption, ultimately through Jesus Christ. And the question is, why did God want to put his people in this little tiny piece of real estate. You can see generally on this map of the Eastern Hemisphere that Israel is right at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa. In fact, it is the only land bridge between those three continents. You can see on this map that I made, the southwest border of Israel goes right up next to Egypt. You'll see to the very south of Israel, is the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea. To the north is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the only way in ancient times and in modern times, if somebody wants to get from Europe to Africa or Asia to Africa, they have to travel through the land that is now called Israel. It is the only land bridge between those three continents. And back before ships and airplanes and trains and cars and trucks and motorcycles. People walked or rode animals between these continents and always went through the land of Canaan. Now there's a reason that God wanted his people to settle in this land. There's a, there's a strategic purpose for that because God was going to make salvation available, redemption available for the whole world. And as the whole world traveled through this land over the ages, they interacted with God's people and heard the, the story of the message of hope, the message of salvation through Messiah who was to come and through Jesus Christ, the same person who did come. And so as the world came through this land and as they left this land, they brought with them the gospel. And that's one of the ways that the gospel went out into the whole world. So this is a very strategic piece of property lots and lots of crossroads. I call Israel, specifically the Jezreel Valley in the middle of Israel, the Tukwila of the Eastern Hemisphere. Because if you go to Tukwila, you've got 405, you've got 5, you've got 167, you've got 518, you've got all these highways that are intersecting right there. And it was strategically brilliant to put a shopping mall there. Because people are coming through all those different places to come to this location and uh, so that is why I call Israel the, the, the Takwila of the, uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. So God's plan and purpose was to get his people into this land. That's what the book of Joshua is about. Uh, he wanted to give this land to his people so they could be a witness to the world. That's plan A. There is no plan B. And God's going to get his people in there. He's going to get him into the land. He's not going to change his mind, and nothing is going to stop him from accomplishing him. 
No plan B. Now, the Canaanites living in this land were godless. They were evil. They'd been given a chance to turn to God. They said no. And uh, they were trying to stop what God was accomplishing. So God says, I'm done. It's time for you to move in. When you come in, take those people out completely. Completely eradicate them. And uh, that's what happened in the book of Joshua. The whole book, if you think about it in this way, the, the message for, for Israel is you get in there and you destroy or be destroyed. And so Israel said, we will do what God tells us to do. It's going to require courageous faith to do so. And that's the theme of the book, courageous faith. So the first 12 chapters of Joshua is all about uh, conquering a land. And the next 12, the final 12 chapters in Joshua is all about settling into the land. So here's the theme. The theme is conquest. The key verse, Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed. Or shattered. Don't be intimidated by what's going around you. Don't be intimidated with the challenge and responsibilities I've given to you. Follow through and be faithful. Why? The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's a good verse for the people of Israel. It's a good verse for us today because it's true. When we know Christ is our Savior, the Spirit of God dwells within us. He is with us wherever we go. That's what Jesus promised in the Great Commission. Go out into the world and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey the law that I've commanded you. And wherever you go, I'm with you. It's the same kind of an idea here that we're reading in Joshua 1, 9. So, he's saying, don't be terrified. Don't be dismayed because this is not going to be easy. It's going to be extremely difficult to do this. And I want us to keep in mind that just because, listen carefully, just because life is hard does not mean you're out of God's will. Sometimes when you're centered in God's will and you're doing exactly what, you, what He wants you to do, those can be the most difficult days for you. That was certainly the case for Israel going into the promised land. It was not easy, but they got it done for the most part. Uh, we do, here's this new feature that we're doing in Route 66. Uh, we summarize each book of the Bible in 10 words or less. You can count them. Some of you already have. The Israelites capture and settle the promised land of Canaan. That's what Joshua is about. If you capture that, you've got the book of Joshua. So it's, it's all about God's people finally receiving the, the physical promise, the inheritance of of the land. This is, listen, this is something that God's people have been waiting for, every person in every generation, for 700 years. That's a long time. And this generation now gets to see it, gets to inherit it. Finally, Israel has her own homeland, but they have to fight to get it. And that's what they're going to do. This book is loaded with warfare. The uh, graphic that we have been allowed to use by Walk Through the Bible is a picture of General Joshua <laughs> conquering the land of Israel. So you remember conquest. Uh, that's what Joshua was about. He went in and led Israel to uh, receive the promise. As I said, there's a lot of conflict in this book. Some of it is quite graphic and uh, pretty ugly. But there are things that needed to be done if Israel is going to receive the promise. And God performed miracles for his people to show them that he can solve any problem in their life. He can win any battle that they're facing. And that nothing is too hard for God. And one of those first miracles we read about in the book of Joshua is crossing the Jordan River. Water has always been a barrier to the people of Israel. The Red Sea was a barrier leaving Egypt. The Jordan River is a barrier getting into the Promised Land. So on either end of this wandering for 40 years, there's a water barrier. And in both cases, God parted the water and his people crossed over on dry land. 
Here's a, a verse that uh, describes a part of that process. Uh, Joshua 3, 14 through 17. It says, When the feet of the priests stepped down into the edge of the water, the water stood up and rose in one heap a great distance. So the people crossed opposite Jericho on dry ground. You'll see images like this one of Israel crossing over, and you'll see the water right there. Now that water backed up uh, 20 to 30 miles. I think it was 30 miles. That's how far back God caused that water to recede. And so there, was, there had to be a very wide path for millions of people to cross. And that's, uh, that's exactly what happened. And notice that the leaders of Israel had to be the courageous ones to begin with. How would you like to be one of those priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant? And God says, I'm going to part the water, but not until you put your foot in the water. <laughs> I, would, I would look for volunteers other than me because, I don't know, do I have the faith to see that happen? But God honored it, and it worked. And so the nation, right at the beginning, was depending on the courageous faith and the, the obedience of her priests to get God's people into the promised land. Now one more thing before we start getting into the content of this book. Crossing the Jordan is not a picture of going to heaven. There are songs written about that. You read poems about that. Um, that is not the picture intended in the scriptures. Uh, because once uh, people get into the promised land, what we see is a whole new dimension of living here on earth. And so going into the promised land, uh, there's a series of tests of faith. Uh, there's conflict and victory. There's miracles and failures, uh, just like the Christian life. So if there's any picture at all of crossing over into the Jordan, it's a picture of what the Christian life is about. Not always easy, but as Christ is our leader, we can be victorious if we are obedient to him. All right. So once Israel crossed over the Jordan, God is going to prepare them uh, to receive the land. So let's take a look at how that unfolds. Number one is this. God always prepares his people for courageous faith. He always prepares them for courageous faith because that is what is required to receive the promise. Israel going into the promised land, they're not going to receive it without courageous faith. Remember, don't be dis dismayed. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. I'm with you. We can do this and we will. So Joshua 5.10 says this, They celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. They're no longer in the desert plains of Moab. They're on the other side of the Jordan. And why are they celebrating Passover? Because the main way that God puts within us and prepares us for courageous faith, I'll put it that way, the main way that God prepares us for courageous faith is to remind us of his faithfulness. That's what Passover is about. It's a remembrance, it's a commemoration of the deliverance of Egypt or Israel out of Egypt and how God intervened for his people and he won for them a victory and set them free. And so they're observing Passover as a way of remembering what God did for our grandparents and parents for the previous generations God did it then he parted the waters and he just did it for us we got this that's what Passover meant to the people of Israel especially those who are about to go in and start receiving the promise that God has made for them and I said uh, that it's not going to be easy for their dream to become a reality there's going to be a lot of conflict there's going to be a lot of warfare. There's going to be a lot of death, a lot of bloodshed. They're going to go from city to city. And God said, I want you to destroy every living thing, man, woman, child, and animal. Wipe them out. And, and it's not because Israel needed real estate. 
You know, that, that's not why the people had to be eliminated. They, were, they needed to be destroyed because they were going to infect God's people with uh, spiritual falsehood. They're going to introduce God's people to idols and lead them into sin. So it's about purity for God's people. And so that's why God said, I want you to just eliminate any potential threat to your spiritual integrity. Wipe it out. Take courage. Because God is saying to his people, in essence, I'm not playing games here. This is serious business. And the future of my people depends on your obedience today. And so God, when he wants to accomplish something, nothing will prevent him from accomplishing it. So he's preparing his people for courageous faith. That's the first segment of Joshua. Here's the second segment, number two. Courageous faith is demonstrated by obedience. By obedience. Chapter 6, verse 20 tells us about how the first city in the promised land in Canaan, Jericho, how it fell, how it was conquered, how it was destroyed. The summary statement is this, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. There used to be walls that surrounded cities for protection. You can see remnants of those walls all over the world in different kinds of ancient civilizations. You can even see some of those walls in Jericho uh, today if you were to go visit that part of the world. So God told these people, I want you to march around the city once a day. One time, once a day for six days. On the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. We're going to blow a horn, a ram's horn, a shofar, seven times. And then you're going to shout. And that's all I want you to do. <laughs> Kind of a strange way to fight a battle, to win a war. But they did it, and those walls collapsed. And then they went in, and they did the cleanup work. God is, is demonstrating to Israel once again his powerful faithfulness. And Jericho was destroyed. Now, uh, in Flock Talk today, uh, we're going to have a little conversation about an ethical challenge that happened in Jericho before the city fell. And so uh, we will, uh, we're going to try to post the Zoom link. It was supposed to be on the description today before, but we'll get, we'll get that up there as soon as we can. We want you to join us for Flock Talk if you can. We're going to talk about this little ethical dilemma that's found in the book of Joshua. But I want us to think about this. The next place that Israel was to take out was a little village, a little town called Ai, and it's spelled Ai. A little place called Ai. Uh, small town, small army. Israel figured, you know, we got this. We can get in there. We can take it. Well, Israel was defeated in that battle. Because there was one man who disobeyed God when they were in Jericho. God said, leave everything in the city for me. Well, this man named Achan took some things for himself. Israel lost their first battle. Normal battle, I guess you could put it that way. And uh, God told Joshua, find out who it was. And they discovered who it was, this man named Achan. And he and his entire family were executed. Uh, they stoned them with stones and burned their bodies with fire in front of all of Israel. That's pretty harsh. But God needed to make it very clear <laughs> to his people Nobody is going to interfere with what I want to do for you, if it's an enemy or if it's a friend. Anybody who interferes with what I am doing for you will face harsh consequences. That had already happened in the wilderness several times. God is not going to play favorites. If people are trying to mess with his plan, there will be consequences for that. So... It's important to remember that it requires courageous faith to receive the promise or the promises of God. Um, courageous faith is demonstrated by obedience. It is not demonstrated by independence. Some people think it's very courageous to be independent. No, it's not. That's spiritual treason. Courage is obedience. Courage is submission to God. So. 
If God says to us, or to anybody, this is how I want you to do things, and we do things our own way instead, we end up facing consequences in our life that don't have to be there. We're going to face trouble, problems, difficulties that don't have to be a part of life. But they are the natural consequences and sometimes the supernatural consequences for independence instead of courageous obedience, courageous faith. And so the rest of this segment in the book of Joshua that we're looking at shows us how God honored the obedience of his people. They got the message. Okay, <laughs> well, we're not going to play games with God. We're going to do exactly what he tells us to do, no matter how difficult that is. And God honored their courageous faith. He performed miracles, and he created for his people a better future. Uh, there, were, there were 30 more battles recorded in the book of Joshua in this segment. And Israel won every single one of them. Uh, God performed miracles as those battles were being fought. For example, one of them is that God caused the sun to stand still so that Joshua and his armies could have a little bit more time to take out the enemies. And this was a huge battle. Five kings, five nations coming after Israel. And Joshua's going, God, I need more time. Then he says, okay, I'll grant it to you. And God also gave them help by throwing large stones from heaven and taking out the enemy armies. Can you imagine that? You, you know, you're just watching these big stones falling down and taking out the enemy. It's amazing. So when we commit to doing things God's way, here's what this illustrates for us. When we commit to doing things God's way, God helps. He performs miracles. He does things that we wouldn't expect because he's creating for us a better future. And uh, for this generation, uh, they did that. They learned to obey God, and now they're living in the promised land. It belongs to them. They own it, and they're living in peace, and living in security, but there's still more work to be done. They're not quite done, and uh, that, that's going to lead us into next week eventually, but uh, let's look at the final segment here of Joshua. Courageous faith is demonstrated by obedience. Number three, final thought is this. Courageous faith is a foundation for a better future. I've mentioned a better future a couple of times. Uh, here's a well-known verse. It says verse 20 in your notes. It should read verse 15. Uh, somebody who has this verse posted in their home made that, that correction for me, so appreciate that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some of you had that verse in your homes. It's well known. It's a good verse. This is something that Joshua said to the people of Israel near the end of his life. He knew that his days were coming to an end. He knew that it was almost done. He had led God's people into Canaan. Uh, they conquered. They received the promise. Most of the work was done. There were still some enemies yet that needed to be eliminated. And until they were, Israel would not be fully secure. So God reminded his people, don't forget all the things that God has done for you. And don't forget him. Don't forget what he wants you to do. Remain focused. Remain faithful. Serve the Lord. As I have done and will continue to do with my family as long as I am here. And so these were words said to the generation that had received the promised land. Now, the next book of Scripture we're going to look at is Judges. Let me give you a little preview. Notice how the book of Judges opens. Notice this. All that generation, which one? The generation that received the promised land. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. They died. And another generation rose up after them, notice this, who did not know the Lord, nor even the work which he had done for Israel. How can that happen? How does that happen? After all the things that this generation had experienced, Joshua called them to be faithful, and they said, we will be faithful. 
uh, they weren't. They got distracted instead. And they didn't follow through on their commitments. They didn't serve the Lord. They didn't even talk about Him to their kids. Their children who were born in the promised land had no idea how mom and dad got here. They didn't know anything about their family history. They didn't know anything about the faithfulness of God. They didn't know God or anything that he had ever done for his people. Wow. Well, Moses warned the people just before going into the promised land that this is a real possibility. That God could be generous to you and you would get distracted by the blessings and forget the blesser. And here's the warning. There are several. I just chose one out of Deuteronomy, the book before Joshua. Be careful for yourself and watch over your soul diligently. This strong language. So that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. And they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. Notice this. But make them known to your sons and your grandsons. They didn't do that. And the book of Judges is loaded with consequences. Joshua is a book of courageous faith. The Judges is all about failure. It's all about what happens when we forget God. What happens when we don't raise up the next generation to know the Lord and the things that he has done. It's very difficult, very troubling. So all those terrible consequences for the failure of this generation that said, we will do this. We will serve the Lord. We will remain faithful. They didn't do it. And we're going to look at what happens as a result. All right, let's talk just for a moment here about Jesus and Joshua. We like to do this for every, at least I like to do it, for every book that we're looking through. Notice this. Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent of the word Jesus. So if you said Joshua in Hebrew, you would say, or if you said Jesus in Hebrew, it would be Yeshua. Yeah, Joshua. Okay. Or in Spanish, Josue. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. There's a lot of parallels between Jesus and Joshua. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says this, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Joshua is all about victory that Israel experienced under the leadership of Joshua. The Apostle Paul is telling us here in 1 Corinthians 15, in a similar way, he doesn't make the direct parallel, but the parallel can be made. In the same way, if we are faithfully obedient to Jesus Christ as our leader, uh, he will give us the victory. So that is, uh, that's the theme of the Christian life. That Jesus Christ is our leader. And as we follow him, there are blessings, there are provisions, there are good things, there is victory, there will be battles, there will be tests and difficulties. But if we choose to remain faithful, we will be victorious. Uh, not only in this life, but for certain in the life to come. So here's our takeaway for the day. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And we've seen the consequence of saying, yeah, I'll do that, but then not following through. So next week when we get into the book of Judges, uh, we'll look at what is required to follow through. You know, what, what happens uh, when parents don't talk about God? Parents don't talk about their family history. Parents don't give a context for life and for living. We're going to see what happens when there is no leadership, not only in the home, but nationally and in tribes as well. Because it, judges is is a book that in many cases lacks leadership. Occasionally God would raise up a leader. And we're going to look at that pattern of those cycles in the book of Joshua. So be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for the promise, not only given to your people such a long time ago, but the same promise Jesus gave to us in what we call the Great Commission, that he is with us wherever we go, even until the end of the age, all the way up to the time when you're finished doing what you want to do here on earth, uh, before a new heaven and a new earth is created. Uh, we thank you for your faithfulness, that we can rely on your power and your trustworthiness to build within us the courage to be obedient, the courage to live by faith. And those of us who want to honor you, who want to serve you, uh, let that not be just in word only, that we say this is what we're going to do, but they would, we would actually follow through. And that you would show us, not only day by day, but often, even moment by moment, here's an opportunity to do that. Here's an opportunity to serve me. And typically, it's whenever we see a need, or we see pain, or we see a difficult situation, or we see a lonely person, or there's a problem that we might be able to solve. If we'll do that in Jesus' name, that's how we're serving you. That's how you're honored. That's how you're glorified. That's how you're seen through your people. So continue to show us, Father, day by day, as I said, even moment by moment, ways that we can serve you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye.